You might remember last year, uh, we had over a thousand toys donated, and one of the f- most fun events we did all last year was the opportunity for all the staff to dress up like Santa, and we gave away all of those toys. It was awesome, and uh, we want to do that again this year, and it's our opportunity kind of as a church to really reach out and touch our community and do it in a real practical way, and it's really simple. All you do uh, when you go Christmas shopping, take your kids with you and you know, spend $20, $25, and you will be shocked how many toys you can get for $20, $25, and bring those toys down to the downstairs lobby, drop them off, and uh, you'll see over the next month all of the toys that get collected, and then we'll have a big, huge wrapping party, and we'll distribute the toys on the 21st. And it will be awesome. It's a great, memorable thing for us to do every Christmas. So we want to invite you to partner with the staff and our families and really blessing and touching our community. Sound good? Uh, I want to highlight one other thing from your program. You might have noticed that we have a special guest. In fact, he comes uh, Thanksgiving weekend every year, which is uh, Jared Ming, very familiar to our church. We helped launch Higher Vision Church Uh, the church that he leads in Southern California about 10 years ago. Uh, It was the first church plant we as a church ever heavily invested into, and it's been great to be a part of that board and to see that. But Jared will be here at the end of November to share, and I want to tell you right now which services he's going to be at live. So you can like make notes now. Uh, We are recording the Saturday night service, so he'll be here live at our Saturday night service. And you might not even have known we had a Saturday night service, but we do. At 5 o'clock, we have dinner, so we eat dinner together. And then at 6 o'clock, we have the same Sunday morning service, same service we do Sunday morning happens here. But Jared will be speaking live Saturday night. He will be speaking live at the 9 a.m. in Everett and then live at the 1030 in Mill Creek. So uh, if you're at one of the other services, he'll be here on video, which will be the service from the Saturday night service. So we don't normally tell you these things, but we're letting you know up front. Um, So if anybody asks, and that's how we have to do it with guests. Sound good? Sound good? All right, grab your Bibles. I want you to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 9. I'm going to start reading from verse 1, and uh, then we will pray together. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now, I want to pause here and say this can get confusing. Because throughout the book of Acts and the entire New Testament, um, Saul is referred to also as Paul. So Luke, the author of Acts, uses those two names interchangeably. Sometimes he's referred to as Saul. Other times he's referred to as Paul. You, if you're not, if you're newer to church, you're not familiar with the Bible, that can seem really confusing. And you're probably wondering, why can't they just call him by one name? Well, I'm going to explain why really quickly. Saul was his Jewish name, and Paul is his Roman name. And you might remember that back at this point in history, Jerusalem was a uh, Roman-occupied territory. And Paul was, even he grew up Jewish, uh, he was a Pharisee, so he was Saul, uh, but he was a Roman citizen, Paul. And most of the New Testament refers to him as Paul, and I will, throughout this message, refer to him as Paul. Everybody get it? So Saul, Paul, interchangeable. Okay, let's keep going. He went to the high priest, and he asked him from letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, in the next several moments, I ask that you would 
anoint me as I speak. Allow the words that I share this morning to not be my own, but may they be yours. And Lord, I pray for those that are here, that you would speak to them, whether they're listening online or they're listening via podcast or they're here live. I ask that you would speak to their hearts and change their lives. And Lord, this morning as we talk about having an encounter, having an experience, Lord, that's what I ask that you would begin to stir up in everyone's heart this morning is the desire for more of you. In Jesus' name I pray, everyone said, amen. amen. Um, there are many things that we say in church that can be confusing. Because oftentimes what we do is we say things and we just assume you know what we're talking about. And if you're newer to church, these phrases uh, can be really confusing. Let me throw out a few. I had an encounter with Jesus. What does that mean? Or, I had an experience at the altar. <laughs> Maybe you've heard someone say, like I did several weeks ago, Jesus rocked my world. <laughs> now again, you don't go to church. These phrases can be kind of confusing. Uh, one of them that you might have heard and wondered about, in fact, you probably heard it on TV shows or, you know, you've heard talk show hosts refer to this. They just throw this phrase out, assuming that everybody understands what they mean. You probably heard, I had a Damascus Road experience. And you've wondered, what are these referring to? Well, what they're referring to, whenever anyone says, I had a Damascus Road experience, or I had an encounter with Jesus at the altar, I had an encounter with God, or, um, you know, Jesus rocked my world, whatever it is, it's referring to that time in their life where they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was real, that it was that defining moment where they were stopped in their tracks and there was no denying that God was doing something in their life. It was a life-altering, a life-changing moment. Sometimes at church, I'll refer to those as those aha experiences, where all of a sudden the light comes on, and your faith goes beyond something that you pay lip service to, but that's something that you believe like deep in your bones, if you know what I'm saying. When I was a youth pastor, I used to refer to this as the moment that a teenager gets it. Because I would see this over and over again as a youth pastor. I would see uh, teenagers start coming to the church or the youth ministry because their parents made them, because they grew up in church, because they were born, you know, in church, you know, whatever. And they start coming and their faith is not their own. Their faith is mom and dad's. Their faith is something that they were taught. And then there was that defining spiritual experience that they had with Jesus, where all of a sudden their faith became personal and it became theirs. They had that get it, aha moment. A Damascus Road experience, an encounter with Jesus, an altar experience. So where do all of those phrases come from? They actually refer to Paul's conversion in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, what I just read to you, is where it's referring to. Because what you don't know about Paul yet is that Paul was public enemy number one. That if you were a believer in Jesus, a follower of Christ, Paul was the number one person to be feared. And where we read in the story... Paul was in Jerusalem and he met with the religious leaders and he asked permission to go to Damascus because he had heard that there were a bunch of people becoming followers of Jesus in Damascus. Remember what I shared with you at the very beginning of this series. I said, when someone is saturated in the Holy Spirit and they talk about Jesus, the message of the gospel is unstoppable. And that was what was taking place in Damascus. 
And Paul wanted to stop it. Paul was uh, the least likely person to ever go to church. He was the least likely person to ever be saved. Um, whenever I have one of those invite services, like we did a couple weeks ago, where it's daylight savings time, and um, I challenged you to think of three people that you're going to pray about and invite to church, there's always that person in the back of your mind that you think of, and you think, that person will never go to church. I mean, we all know someone that we think will never go to church, and we would say, if I was to come up with a top 10 list of people that are the least likely to ever give their life to Jesus, this person would be number one. That was Paul. Paul was not only opposed to the message of Jesus, he went out of his way to stop those that were talking about Jesus. Paul was the guy that had Christians arrested for their faith. Let me talk to you a little bit about how bad Paul was. In Acts chapter 7, verse 58, you might remember I shared with you guys the story of uh, Stephen getting stoned. It was the first time somebody was killed for their faith in Jesus. And it was tragic, and you hear this story of, you know, boulders and rocks being thrown at him, and how he gets hit with these stones, and he falls to his knees, and he prays, and he says, Lord, forgive them for what they're doing. And it's this incredibly moving moment in Scripture. What you might not have known is that Paul was there. Verse 58, while Stephen is being stoned, it says, meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul or, or Paul. So uh, what was happening was those that were stoning Stephen, they would take off their outer robe and they laid them at Paul's feet. And that is them basically acknowledging that Paul was one of the leaders of this opposition. At the end of this entire scene of Stephen being stoned, we read in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, that, and Saul, or, approved of them killing Stephen. So you get this picture of, they lay their clothes at Paul's feet so Paul could keep watch. And he didn't get his hands dirty. He just sat with his arms folded and watched Stephen be stoned. And he approved of the killing. In Acts chapter 22, verse 20, this is long after Paul has had this Damascus Road experience. He refers back to seeing Stephen be martyred. When he says this, he says, And the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed... I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. In Acts chapter 8 verse 3, it describes Paul, kind of his life mission, his life purpose, what Paul believed his calling was. It says, Saul, or, began to destroy the church, going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. A couple things I want to say about this. That word destroy in the original Greek would be more accurately translated uh, desired physical harm. And he went home to home. Remember several weeks ago I talked about the value of the early church and I said one of their values was community, that they would gather together in each other's homes and they would break bread and eat together and worship together and pray together. So Paul took their value. He knew where they'd be. He said those Christians, they all hang out together at each other's houses and he would go to their homes and drag them out of their homes, causing at times physical harm. He was not opposed to anything happening to stop the gospel message from being spread. Paul was public enemy number one. To a Christian, he was someone to be feared. 
It was someone to be avoided. And now Paul is on his way to Damascus to once again stop this Christian uprising from taking place. He heard a message that the gospel of Jesus was spreading in Damascus. And he thought, I'm going to stop it before it begins. So then as the Bible says, he was on his way to Damascus in verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So on his way to Damascus, he gets stopped in his tracks and he has this experience, this encounter with God. Jesus rocks his world, stops him cleaning his tracks. Paul referred to this experience often later on in life. And, and I only share some of this because I want you to understand how unlikely this was that this would happen to Paul. I mean, if there was anyone you would think would not have an encounter with Jesus, it was Paul. Paul said this about himself in Acts chapter 22, verse 4. He said, uh, he was before the church in Jerusalem. He said, man, I persecuted all of you. That was my job. Paul was zealous. He was passionate. He was focused. He was determined. Paul thought trying to stop these blasphemers, these heretics from talking about Jesus was the right thing to do. And with lots of zeal and passion and tenacity, he did whatever he could to stop people from talking about Jesus. He goes on and he says in Acts chapter 26, he's talking to King Agrippa. He said, I put Christians in prison. Not only that, when they were tried for the possibility of being executed, he said, I always casted my vote for their death. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, Paul said about himself, he said, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because of the things I did to the church. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, he uh, said, I, I know you've, you know who I am. I know my reputation has preceded me. You heard how intensely I persecuted the church. And then later on in that chapter, in verse 23, he says, and now you're probably confused because the person that passionately persecuted the church is now the primary spokesman for the church. When you talk about the least likely person getting saved, that was Paul. But on his way to Damascus, Paul had an encounter with Jesus. He had an undeniable experience. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. That was an absolutely undeniable encounter with Jesus. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but didn't see anyone. Man, they knew something had happened, and they knew Paul had experienced something, but they couldn't understand what they heard, and they couldn't interpret what they saw. They just knew something happened. Do you know that it took an encounter like this to stop Paul in his tracks? I mean, when you are so focused and you are so determined and you are so resolute in your position that it took this type of encounter to stop Paul and get him to change direction. So I'm just curious, have you ever had 
that type of encounter with Jesus? Have you ever had that moment where your life was heading one way, you thought, man, this is what I'm going to do, this is my purpose, this is my plan, and you had this moment with Jesus. Maybe it was at an altar, maybe it was at a camp, maybe it was just praying by yourself or just reading the Bible, but you had this undeniable encounter with Jesus. Maybe God physically touched your body. Maybe you were sent on a divine appointment and you were in a situation where uh, this is more than a coincidence. I mean, God sent me here. Maybe you were on the other end of a divine appointment. Maybe God sovereignly sent someone to you. But you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, man, this is legit. This is real. But have you ever had that moment where you encounter Jesus in such a way your world gets turned upside down? Where you get rocked to the core of your being. I mean, here's Paul. He is on his way to destroy Christians, to stop them by whatever means necessary from proclaiming Jesus. And on his way to do this, he encounters Jesus. And I'll tell you something. If that's you, and you've ever had that type of experience, I mean, it is undeniable and secondly, you can't stay the same. I mean, afterwards, you're, you're different. You cannot deny what has happened to you. You know, we, um, for the last several weeks, we've talked about being sent on a divine appointment. And you might remember, I, I said this to you. I said, uh, uh, our job is to say, Jesus, these are my hands. These are my feet. This is my mouth. I'm ready, able, and willing. I have raw faith. I'm ready to go where you want me to go. I'm ready to say what you want me to say. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. I am ready, available, and willing. So catch this, because while God was rocking Paul's world on the way to Damascus, while he is stopping him in his tracks, turning his life upside down. He's also working on the heart of a Christian man by the name of Ananias. And I love the story of Ananias for a couple reasons because um, it immediately makes us say it's not just the apostles or the vocational ministers God wants to use. Because who was Ananias? He was just a guy who went to church and believed in Jesus and was faithful uh, Ananias was that guy that said, these are my hands, this is my feet, this is my mouth. I'm ready, available, and willing. Jesus, if you want to use me, you want to send me on a divine appointment, man, I am open. So while Paul is having his life turned upside down, God is working on the heart of a guy who attends church. And here's that story. So uh, Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could not see. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Then in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Try and say that 10 times fast. I've been practicing it a lot. Straight street. Uh, straight street. Straight street. Uh, go to the house of Judas on straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So remember, you're Ananias. You're the church guy. You're just trying to be faithful. I mean, you work at Boeing, but you want to be a good Christian man. And so you've said, Lord, 
These are my hands. This is my feet. This is my mouth. Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do. And he just makes himself available. And the Lord says, I want you to go meet Paul. And you're like, say what? (laughs) Paul? Are you talking about that guy who had Stephen killed? Are you talking about that guy that we've heard is on his way to our town to have us arrested, thrown in prison, possibly executed for our faith? Lord, I'm sorry, but I think you might have got your lines crossed here a little bit. Are you crazy? Why would you send me on a suicide mission? I know who Paul is. But the Lord said to Ananias, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Um, What I find really, really interesting here is we talk a lot about calling in the church. You probably hear ministers talk about the call of God. And anytime you ever hang out with a vocational minister, they'll always talk about that moment that they had their call. And it's almost like they describe it this way. Ah, it's like this magical sound, you know, and they're like, the call. What is the call? Here you're getting an illustration of a call. I mean, on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, God strikes Paul blind. And then he says, I want you to go into Damascus and I'm going to send a person to you who's going to tell you what you must do. That phrase, must do. In the Greek, we find it 22 different times in the New Testament. And every single time, it's referring to a divine calling, a divine purpose, a call from God. And so the Lord says, Ananias, man, I know this doesn't make sense, but I'm going to send you to Judas' house to pray for Paul, and you are going to help him with his divine purpose and his calling. Do you know that for every great man or woman of God, there was a person along the way that said to like a young Billy Graham, you know, you really have like an evangelistic bent to you. There's that person that spoke into their life, that person that you know, looked at Bill Gates and said, you seem to have some really good programming aptitude. Maybe you should discover that a little bit. And said to Steve Jobs, you're pretty creative. Maybe you could make a career out of this someday. That person behind the scenes that believed in somebody and spoke into someone. Now, some of you would say, well, Pastor Brandon, man, I I can't even get people to go to my growth group. Okay? Okay. You know, Christian makes me a growth group leader. People don't sign up for my growth group. I end up with four or five people, but you don't know who those four or five people are. You don't know who they're going to end up as. I mean, Ananias that day, he's just a dude who attends church, wanting to be faithful. But God sent him on a mission to lay his hands on probably the most influential apostle. The guy who wrote over half the New Testament. That's what was the assignment, the divine appointment that Ananias was being sent on. And what happens next is just crazy because Ananias easily could have said something like what I would have said. I mean, if God says, Brandon, I want you to go to uh, the guy that's murdering people for their faith, I'd say that is a good assignment for me to delegate to Morgan. Um, But what does the Bible say? It says Ananias went and he showed up at Judas's house on Straight Street (laughs) and he sees Paul who for the last three days has been praying and fasting, wondering what this is all about. I mean, you talk about getting your world turned upside down. I mean, you thought you were doing the right thing by trying to shut down Christianity And then you have this encounter with Jesus that is undeniable and you cannot stay the same. 
I mean, in those moments when you have that, you'll either run towards Jesus or you'll run away from him, but you cannot stay where you were. And Paul knew that everything's going to change from this point on, and he wondered what was next. And then Ananias walks into that house, sees public enemy number one. And what does the Bible say? He says, he says, brother Saul. I mean, that blows my mind. He calls him brother. A week ago, that would have never happened. But in that one moment, Ananias is saying to Paul, Paul, your family. Paul, we forgive you. Paul, we understand you didn't know what was happening. And uh, let me read it because Luke describes it better than I would be able to. Verse 17, it says, Then Ananias went to the house, and he entered, and he placed his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with, with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. When you have this altar experience, this encounter with God, this Damascus Road experience, this time when Jesus rocks your world, I mean, it is undeniable. You cannot stay the same. And then finally, you never forget about it. I mean, from that day forward, Paul's life was changed. Paul goes from being the primary opposition to the gospel to now being the primary spokesman for the gospel. Paul went from being someone who persecuted Christians to being someone who ends up persecuted for his faith. Um, Paul talked about it often, and there's so many times throughout the entire New Testament where Paul referred to that moment, that Damascus Road experience that changed him, that turned his life upside down, that turned his world around. He referred to it often. I just want to read one. Because I really think it sums up Paul. It sums up who he was uh, before he had that experience and who he is since. Because before Paul had that encounter with Jesus, Paul prided himself in being such a great Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was highly religious. He meticulously followed the law. He was zealous. For the law. In fact, he was that one that confronted anyone when they weren't following the law. And it says this uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. And it's talking about when you have confidence in your flesh, when you have confidence in you. So, how, how many of you, if you were, this is a rhetorical question, don't answer, but think about it. How many of you, if you were honest, you'd say, man, I'm really confident in me. I'm confident in my mind. Confident in my ability to work hard. Confident in my education. I'm really confident in who I am. Paul said, if there's anyone who had the right to be confident in his flesh, it was me. And then he tells you his resume. He said, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He said, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. He said, I was a good Jew. I was circumcised. I'm a part of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was zealous. Man, I was so zealous, I persecuted the church. And as for righteousness based upon the law, based upon Leviticus, I was 
faultless. I did nothing wrong. He said, basically, as for like confidence in me, man, I had it over and over and over again. I was proud of myself. But then he says this. He says, but that was before Damascus Road. He said, but whatever were gains to me, verse 7, I now consider loss for the sake of... I now consider everything. Where am I at? I was trying to read it off the screen and I got lost. Uh, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything a loss, like all that stuff that I prided myself in. I consider it a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. I bet when he wrote that, he paused and then he said, my Lord. For whose sake I lost all things. He said, all that stuff that I strive to gain, he said, on the way to Damascus, Jesus rocked my world, turned my life upside down. Everything that I cared about before, I didn't care about anymore. All the stuff that really mattered to me before didn't matter to me anymore. In fact, I consider all of that. What does he say? I consider it all garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. You see, when you have an encounter with Jesus, when you have an altar experience, when you have a Damascus Road experience, it is, it's undeniable. And you cannot stay the same. And you never forget that moment. Paul had the first Damascus Road experience, but I'm I'm sure in here, there's others of you that would say, I remember that moment. I remember that time where Jesus really touched my life. And I, I, I share this partially to remind you of that moment because because of it you can't stay the same and because of that moment you'll either run towards Jesus or you will run away from him but as hard as you try you can never forget what happened to you there and then I also share it because there are also some of you that is something that you deeply desire you're like hey if there's more of Jesus then I want more If there's more of God, if I could encounter God in such a real way, I I want that type of encounter. I don't know about you, but I want that type of encounter for my kids. I want my kids to have that aha moment, that moment where their faith becomes more than just Brandon and Di's faith, mom and dad's faith, but it becomes real for them. I want them to have a Damascus Road experience. I want everybody to stand up on your faith. And, yeah. This is what happens when the Huskies coog it. That's the way my brain thinks now. I'm still recovering from that game. Um, I want to ask you just one question, and then I want to pray for you. And I, I, I'm going to share this because I'm kind of trying to set you up. For the next couple weeks. For the next two weeks, we're going to talk to you about uh, spiritual gifts and being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that a lot. And there's going to be different voices that are going to come and they're going to talk to you about 
maybe their Damascus Road experience. And what I want to challenge you with is just be open. Just come to church, maybe a bit anxious, knowing what they're going to talk about and that we're going to really lay hands on, anoint people with oil, pray for people, and believe that God will strike you blind for a while. Just kidding, not really. Uh, maybe. Um, but I want, I want you to come to church open, expecting, anticipating, being willing with a mindset that says, all right, Lord, I'm kind of naturally a skeptic, but if there's more of you, then I should want more. If you can touch me, then I, I want to be touched. I want to open myself up to you. So for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, what that means. But I want to pray for you to kind of set you up for it. If you're here today and you're willing to say, all right, Pastor Brandon, I'm willing to begin to open myself up. I don't know what this means. Maybe some of you, you do and you want, you know, you're thinking it'd be nice to have a fresh touch from Jesus. But you're willing to say, I I'm ready over the next week to have anticipation, expectation, uh, all of this build in my heart. Now I'm ready for more of Jesus. I want to pray for you to close our service. And so if that's you, would you raise up your hands? Just raise them up. One of the reasons that I have you raise your hands like this when I do this is because this is a sign of surrender. This is you saying, Lord, I, I, I surrender. When uh, my twin boys, Judah and Elijah, were really little and they were tired and they needed me to carry them, they would walk over to me with their hands raised and that was like, Dad, pick me up. But I also love to use this illustration that when we stretch out our hands like this, it looks like a funnel. And what does a funnel do? A funnel takes a lot of something and it isolates it into a steady stream. And that's what I'm praying and believing will happen over people in our church. That God will, uh, in a steady stream, fill our hearts and our minds with more of his presence. So if you're, if you're ready to say, all right, Pastor Brandon, over the next week, Build my anticipation and excitement. I need Jesus to do that. I want you to raise your hands. Lord Jesus, right now, I lift up these people that are here this morning. You see every hand that is outstretched, and that is symbolic of people that are saying, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready for you to do something in my life like you've done in other people's lives. I'm ready for you to touch me. And now, Lord, I pray that you would begin to soften hearts. You would begin to take away distractions. And you would begin to ready people for an encounter with you. And Lord, I want to pray that throughout this week, this expectation, this anticipation would build up deep with inside of them and that next weekend when they come to church they would be they would come anxious expecting patient and ready for what you are going to do in their heart and lord i pray that over the next two weeks every person in our church whose heart is open i ask that they would have an unexplainable breakthrough, an undeniable encounter with you in their life. I thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. If you're here, if you need prayer for anything, I'm going to have my staff kind of line up among the front. We'd love to anoint you with oil and pray for you. If you need to go, we want to thank you for coming to Canyon Creek Church. We'll see you next week.